So hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming in such a great head count. Uh, actually, it's my honor uh, to invite you here in the name of two institutions. One, and the main one, the organizer of the event, being Prague Wall Street Club, and the second, being Institute of Strategic Investment. Actually, Mr. Professor, I'm sorry for the word strategic. <laughs> I know that you're not you know, particularly fond of the word. But yeah, it was actually my idea. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that uh, we are welcoming you here in the name of uh, two institutions made me think about one team. And actually, I will tell you about two teams today. One, the first one being cooperation. So it's been, what, four years, I guess, since we founded together with the uh, the Prague Wall Street Club. And we've had uh, quite a success with it, I, I must say. Right? And then, the, the <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's the trick you have to prize yourself. Nobody else does it. <laughs> and when I was thinking about it, we wouldn't be able to do it alone. Because alone, you can only accomplish so little, but together, you can accomplish so much. And by these words, I would very much like to thank two persons, mostly and foremost, being Albert, Albert Christoph. Please stand up. Albert is the man who has been running Prague Wall Street Talk for the last year. And I must honestly say it was the most successful year, which again made me think about two things. One being that we've made a good choice hiring Albert. And second, we've made a good choice that we stepped down. <laughs> the next person definitely would be Emilia. Emily, please stand up. And we have been with us since starting. Then we have uh, Robert Johnson, but I don't think Robert, Robert's here. And for the second institution, in Institute of Strategic Investment, there is David Mazacek who's doing a tremendous job with it. I mean, the second theme that I would like to leave you with is uh, leadership and leadership support. Because although we've had a lot of drive and ideas and, and you know, taste for these things, we wouldn't be able to accomplish anything without senior support. And there were a lot of these guys, but I would particularly like to thank two of them. One, for the Prague Wall Street Talk, being Jirka Treschel, uh, who has founded Professional Knowledge Applied, which is a platform where you can learn so much about finance and become extremely knowledgeable by watching uh, videos and, and trying it and the second guy is Dean Maisley, Dean of the Faculty of Finance and Accounting here at Vachet. So these guys have been with us and fought for us and stood up for us when we needed it the most in the beginning. So again, welcome and thank you everybody for coming. Now I would like to give word to you. So I can imagine how much you are looking forward to actually Mr. Damodaran speaking, so let me be rather short. I actually still remember the moment when I decided to spend a year of my life teaching the replicated classes of Mr. Damodaran. And uh, I remember especially me writing the email to Mr. Damodaran. So I spent well, like a week writing and drafting the email. You know, I really wanted to be, to be perfect. And he actually replied within something like 10 minutes or like half an hour. So, um, and then I actually asked him like, a couple of months after that, like, how does he do it? I mean, he's, he must be receiving hundreds of emails every day. And he gave me the rule like when you open it, you gotta reply to it. And um, I think once you start your professional career, this is actually quite valuable because otherwise you would be overwhelmed. So that was actually one of the first lessons I learned. And the second is uh, actually learning and uh, and working with Professor Damodaran really made me uh, want to pursue career in corporate finance, and it really got me inspired. And uh, I hope this lecture today uh, will do it similar for you. So uh, please get inspired, and uh, again, thanks a lot to Professor Damodaran for you know, cooperating with us so closely for the last three years. I think it's absolutely amazing what you're doing, putting everything online, and uh, making, you know, allowing people all around the world to have access to this kind of knowledge. I think it's absolutely tremendous. So thanks a lot for, for coming today, and uh, please enjoy the lecture.
classroom on a Thursday evening. <laughs> Sitting and listening to me when you can be out there. This is even worse. It's a Friday evening. You know what everybody else in Prague is doing, right? I, I walk by at least three pubs and six bars, they're all full, and you're sitting in here listening to me. But hopefully it won't be too painful. That's my idea. That's not making it too painful. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history. I came to NYU in 1986. When I came to NYU, I was just hired as an assistant professor. They gave me a class to teach. It was a class called Security Analysis. You heard of this class? It's a class with a very long and hoary tradition. It was taught at Columbia University by a guy called Ben Graham. And he had only five students in his class, which tells you that he wasn't probably that good of a teacher. But the five students he had turned out to be the most famous students of all time. One of them, of course, happened to be Warren Buffett. So this is a class that's been around a long time. They give the class to me and they said, you better teach this class. And I said, I really don't want to teach. That's the most boring class I can think of. Because by 1986, it was showing its age. It was a collection of talks. It was four weeks in stocks, and three weeks on bonds, and two weeks in options and futures, and five weeks on institutional detail. Like what? There was an entire session on listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> Teaching was so easy in the days before Wikipedia. You could actually come into class and list the 12 requirements. People thought you were a genius. They took everything down. If I tried that today, people would be checking Wikipedia while I'm doing it. I could see it right here. Why are you repeating? So I went to the head of my department and said, I don't want to teach this class. Not a great attitude. You can hire as an assistant professor, right? The guy was a good guy. He said, what would you like to teach instead? I said, I'd like to teach evaluation class. He said, don't do it. <laughs> There isn't enough stuff in valuation to actually fill a class. And you know what? It was absolutely right. In 1986, there wasn't enough stuff. There were no books on valuation. There were no papers on valuation. He said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff. And I really, really, really wanted to use this class. And I discovered very early in my academic life that if you want to get something done at a university, the best way to get it done is to do it subversively. Because if you try to get official permission, you know what would happen, right? A committee would be formed. Many of these guys meet on a committee. Committees meet and meet at their baby committees and subcommittees. And by the time they got back to me and told me I could teach this class, I'd be too old to teach them. Anyway. <laughs> so he so, told the head of the department, I teach your damn security analysis class. I didn't use the word damn, but that's how I felt. And I walked in and taught a valuation class. I had no idea what I do in a classroom. I could be teaching cooking for 15 weeks. <laughs> These are good old days. No cameras. You close the door. You could do whatever you wanted. You ruled the classroom. You know how long it took them to find out? In 2008, <laughs> I get a call from the dean's office. So said, we're here we're teaching a valuation class. I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. <laughs> they said, we don't see the name valuation on the course schedule. I said, that's easy to explain. I've been hijacking all these other classes you've been giving me and teaching valuation instead. And the equity instruments and markets class you asked me to teach, I'm not in the least bit interested in equity instruments or markets. You take equity instruments, markets out of it, what do you have to design? So I taught valuation instead. They said, that's not right. I said, I agree. We should call it valuation. <laughs> so starting in 2008, you will see the word valuation show up in the NYU course schedule. But last spring was my 53rd semester teaching that class. And I'm going to say something about that class that's going to encapsulate how I think about valuation. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching that class. That's how I phrased it. I didn't, the first semester I taught valuation, I was two weeks ahead of my class. <laughs> the first day they show up, what, where's the syllabus? I gave them a two-week syllabus, but they said it's a 15-week semester. I said, we'll have to figure out what happens after two weeks. Let's take it a week at a time. 
I could have run out of stuff after two weeks. I could make up stuff as I went along. In fact, three of my books came out of having to make up stuff for valuation classes. But my typical valuation class is 400 MBAs. Taught in an amphitheater about, little bit, about twice the size of this one. It's a little bit like being in one of those Roman Colosseums with the lions and you walk in. The only difference is I'm the lion and they're the ones who have to worry about being eaten. So the first day I walk in, you've got 400 terrified MBAs. very high-tech product, number crunching. So I start off with a question, and I'm going to start off with the same question that I start them off with. The first question they have for me, you ready? Is valuation an art or a science? Let me break that down. Is valuation a science? Let me make it even simpler. Is mathematics a science? It is the only pure science. In fact, mathematicians are convinced that the rest of us are imposters. So let me ask you a follow-up question. What makes mathematics a science? I'm sorry, what? Universal principles. Psychology has universal principles. None of them work. But it's not science. Add on to that. It's universal principles that if I try to prove, I'm able to prove absolutely every single time, right? Mathematics is absolutes. Two plus three is? This is not a good question. It's five. Whether I count it on my fingers on a calculator, on a computer, on the North Pole, the South Pole, it doesn't matter. Two plus three is always five. Mathematics is the science of absolutes. If I get the inputs right, I will get the output right. So mathematics is a science. Is physics a science? Yeah, mostly, right? The laws of gravity are the laws of gravity. You climb up to the top floor of this building, manage to get one of those windows open, and all jumped out, we don't fall in the order of our IQs. Or where we are in the corporate hierarchy, or what your GPA is, we all fall. Physics is mostly a science. So the definition of a science is you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Is valuation a science? It's not even close. If you get you can get every single input in the value of a company right and be horribly wrong on the output, get used to it. So if you're holding on to some hope that one of these days valuation will become science, let it go. It's not going to be a science. It's not a science. It must be an art, right? Let's, let's uh, take a look at what, what an art is. painting an art? Not house painting, but you know, painting. <laughs> house painting is definitely not an art. Yeah, right? What makes this big castle guy so special? I still remember about 15, 20 years ago. My old son is 28. When he was 8 years old. I took him into the Met to see a big castle. Because I wanted to give him a little culture because he was not so on culture. He said, you might as well have some culture. I take him in and 35 minutes later would come out of the exhibit. And I said, Ryan, what did you think of that? He said, I wasn't impressed by it. I said, what do you mean were impressed? It's a big castle exhibit. He said, this guy can't get the nose in the right place. Have you noticed this about the castle? The nose comes out of the side of the head, the top, and it's almost like he was either drunk or drugged, and he couldn't figure out where the nose went. But for whatever reason, we've all gathered together this Picasso guy is special. We pay a couple of hundred million dollars to that painting. The essence of an art is you really cannot teach it. You either have it or you don't. Thank God, valuation is not an art. I've wasted 32 years of my life, 53 semesters, trying to teach something that cannot be taught. So it's not an art and it's not a science. What the heck is it? I'll give you the word I used to describe valuation. It is a craft. I'll give you the analogy that I gave earlier. It's closer to cooking than you think. How do you master cooking? You can do what my daughter does. You know what she does? She watches cooking shows on the Food Network all day long. She can't cook a leg. But she can tell you in the abstract how to make a souffle because she's seen it so many times on TV. 
You don't learn cooking by watching TV. You don't learn cooking by reading cookbooks. You learn cooking by cooking. And the first time you cook, what happens? Disaster. <laughs> you set off fire alarms, things go off in the tank. I remember the first time I scrambled eggs. Nobody told me I was supposed to spray the damn pan. So I scrambled the egg. Great looking eggs, but they're stuck to the pan. Pan and eggs went into the trash, but I learned a very important lesson, which is if you're going to scramble, egg, scramble eggs, spray the pan. You live and learn. Valuation is a craft. You get better at valuation by doing what? Not listening to me talk about valuation. The next two hours are going to be completely and totally wasted. It's not by reading my books or my blog posts about valuation, complete waste of time. It's by picking a company and value it. And the first time you value a company, what's going to happen? Disaster. You're going to say, this is impossible to do. I'm going to hire somebody else to do it, and I'm going to do it from a cookbook. Stay in there. Every time you value a company, you will learn something new about valuation. My regular valuation class. Each week, I put up what I call evaluation of the week. So, first week of class, you know, we just introduced the class. I put up evaluation of the week. Now, in spring of 2017, week one, I valued Apple. Why? Because I wanted to value Apple. It's all about me anyway. I valued Apple and I put it on with my spreadsheet and my story. And I told people, well, I valued Apple. Why don't you take my valuation and try to value Apple? You know the reaction was, right? It's the first week of class, we don't know a thing. I said, it's okay. Just take the spreadsheet, change what you feel you can change. So they take my valuation and they change the second decimal point of the risk free rate, leave everything else the same. <laughs> and they come back and say, you know what? I got a value just like yours. I didn't say a thing. So I created a Google shared spreadsheet where they all enter their valuations and on Monday when they come in, I show them a histogram of what they found. And the first week, guess what? Your one big bar right around my value. They all had each other back. Look, we mastered valuation. We got the same number as he did. I don't say a word. Next week, I pick a company. A different company, Tesla. As different from Apple as again, I do the same thing and I ask them to do it. And each week I keep experimenting. I push the limits. I do PZ Cousins Nigeria, I do chess, I do whatever. And, and each week, the reason I pick chess is that that's a company I value yet. What a depressing company to value. <laughs> this is like watching the Bataan Death March, right? <laughs> Revenues drop by 1% every year, margins keep shrinking. There's no good ending to the story. Last time I talked about storytelling. Like a horror story, a slow moving horror story. So I value the company and each week they do this, and one of the things I see happening is as I go from week one to week two to week three, people start to feel free to disagree with me. They feel more comfortable. And somewhere in week seven or eight, I know the class is working. When somebody in the class comes up to me and says, That valuation you put up this week, everything you did was wrong. Classes work. We learn valuation by doing. And if valuation is a craft, you're never quite going to master it, right? Because in a sense, you're always going to find something new to learn. And that's something I have to remind myself every single day. Just when I think I've got things under control, things get out of control. Just when I think I've mastered something, everything blows up on me. And I have to be willing to revisit things I took for granted. You know what the three most free words in investing and valuation are? I was wrong. Because until you say it, you can't change the way you do things. Because as long as that I am right, I am right, I am right, everything you do will be defensive. So I'm going to set up what I'm going to talk about today with evaluation. It's a valuation of a company that I'm a little obsessed with. Uber. I valued Uber for the first time in June, in June of 2014 as a disruptive car sharing company, car service company. Then I valued it again in September of 2015 as a global disruptor. In 2016, I valued them as the rule breaker. 
because that's what Uber does. In 2017, I've got to value them again. And this was my June 2017 valuation of Uber. It's a pretty expensive story. It's about a company that's in car service and delivery that's going to grow fast and hopefully improve margins over time. So it's a traditional valuation of Uber. The high revenue growth, the margins, and cash flows. The way I've always done valuation, the way I've been taught valuation, the way I write about valuation, the value entire company. So I put up my valuation and I cut to the chase. I come up with a value of about $37 billion. You can see it right there, or $36 billion as my value for the company. So this is a blog post. I put up my valuation, I tell my story, I put up my numbers. And whenever I post a valuation on my blog, I hear from me in good ways and bad ways. And this one, people, of course, have feedback on my valuation. The most common feedback is the one I expected, which is I don't like your growth rate, I don't like your margins, I don't like your cost of capital, which my, my response is, if this is my story, you want to tell your story, tell it yourself. So you want higher growth? Go ahead, the spreadsheet's right there. You don't like my margins, change them. So that I'm used to. But one of the responses I got to this valuation, and it's from somebody I respect, said they're using 20th century technology to value a 21st century company. So discounted cash flow valuation value the whole company. That worked in the 20th century. We're in the 21st century where companies measure success based on numbers. Not the numbers they show in their financials, but the numbers behind the numbers. Sounds mysterious, right? When I say Facebook, what's the most impressive number about Facebook? You think it's revenues? It's revenues only about 50 billion. That's not that impressive. If you look at Walmart, Walmart's revenues are 500 billion. Facebook's revenues are only 50 billion. Is it profits? It's true they're a profitable company, but there are companies that are far more profitable. Apple is three times more profitable than Facebook. It's not the revenues. It's, it's the number of users. And how many users does Facebook have? 2.2 billion. Think about it for just a moment. One in three people on the face of this earth is a Facebook user. And here's an even scarier number. 55 minutes. You know what I'm talking about? Last year, on average, that's how much time a Facebook user spent on Facebook every single day. And that's not even counting WhatsApp and Instagram. Collectively, you have 2.2 million people, one third of the, the global population, checking out their Facebook page for one sixteenth of the waking time they have on this earth. That's a pretty scary big number, right? So when you think Facebook, you think 2.2 billion people. When you think Uber, it's not the revenues that are impressive, it's definitely what, not what they report as profits because they don't report profits, they report big losses. The fact that they're not about 300 cities. They have you know, millions of riders, they have 40 million Uber riders. So when you look at the companies of the 21st century, it's true. When they present themselves, they're presenting themselves based on look how many users we have, look how many subscribers we have. And if it's young companies, it gets even worse, right? It's all about users and members and subscribers. But it's not just young companies. Take Microsoft. Microsoft until 10 years ago, maybe even 8 years ago, the way they made money is they did upgrades of Office and Windows. Every time they did an upgrade, you had to pay for the upgrade, they made money. Today, you know what Microsoft's crown jewels? Office 365. Office 365 is a subscription model. They charge you, what, $79 every year and they collect the money. And that is their crown jewel because it's almost a guaranteed cash flow stream. You know why Microsoft got LinkedIn? For their premium subscription membership. Adobe, I used to buy Adobe software. Now I can no longer buy software. I have to be a subscriber to Adobe Creative Cloud. Increasingly, companies seem to be moving away from the old way of doing business and focusing on subscribers, users, and customers. And he said, you're using 20th century technology, D.C.F. That's how he described it, on 21st century companies. My first reaction was, you have no idea what you're talking about. But then I said, you know what, you have a point. 
If the essence of a craft is I should be willing to re-examine how I do things, maybe I'm doing things wrong, maybe I should be able to value a user, a subscriber, a member. But then I took responsibility. Here's why. I said the problem is not with DCF. DCF just says the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows of the asset. It doesn't say anything about companies. So if I define DCF as, as value of an asset based on cash flows, I don't see why I should be able to value a user or a subscriber. All I need to do is estimate the cash flows of the user, come up with a risk adjusted discount rate. I should be able to value any, no, any item that I want. I said, don't blame the model, blame me. I said, I should have thought about that in the user. I did not. It's not the d.c.f that's at fault. It's a person using that d.c.f. So I said, you can value Uber based on its drivers. by value value. He responded with one word, right. Pissed me off no. Because what's right said? Yeah, you are talking about it, you never do it. So for the next month, that's what I did. I tried to value a Uber rider and value Uber from the rider stuff. And I'm going to take you through the structure that I created value Uber rider because I've milked it since to value an Amazon Prime member, a Netflix subscriber, a Spotify subscriber. And I've learned about Things about value that I would never have learned if I had not opened that door and walked in. When you value companies, while we traditionally value companies as aggregate companies, the entire company, we've also, also always known that valuation is aggregate. You know what I mean by that? If I give you a company like Coca Cola that is in six, con I mean, it's in six continents and 50 countries, I can value Coca-Cola as a combined company, or I can take each part of the world that Coca-Cola is and say Coca-Cola Latin America, Coca-Cola US, Coca-Cola Europe, and value each slice separately, and I should be able to add them up because value is added. If I give you a multi business company like Siemens, you can break Siemens down into its individual businesses and value each business separately. It's called some of the parts valuation. We don't do it very well. We don't do it very often, but you can do it. And what we're doing with user-based valuation is kind of an extension of that disaggregated valuation. And it is true that there are advantages you get when you value a company on a disaggregated basis. Basically, the principles don't change, but you're essentially applying the principles of each slice of the company, and here are the advantages you get. Let's assume Coca-Cola in North America has flat revenues, and it does. There's no growth left in North America anymore. Because people don't like to drink soda, too much sugar, not good for your health. But let's say Coca-Cola Asia is growing 10% a year. If I value Coca-Cola in its individual slices, I can give its North American slice zero growth and a different discount rate. And its Asian slice a much higher growth and a much higher discount rate. It allows me to discriminate across different parts of a company by giving each part different characteristics. It also allows me to tell a different story about each part of the company. Rather than try to tell one big story for the whole company, I can tell a different story for each part. And if I'm helping the managers, this is incredibly useful if you're a multi-business company to know what parts of your company create value for you and what parts destroy value. So why don't we do disaggregated valuation to every company? Why do we compress everything into one number, total revenues, total earnings? Why do you think we do that? To do a valuation of Coca-Cola geographically, what do I need to know? I need to know revenues that Coca-Cola Coca Coca gets in every part of the world, which I can get. I also need to know that cost of goods sold broken down by region. I need to know how much they reinvest in each region, capital expenditure, working capital depreciation. And Coca-Cola reports none of those things. The reason we don't do disaggregated valuation is not because we don't know how to do it, but because the information is not there. So I'm going to make a confession before I take you on this journey of value users. The kinds of information you need to value users is not given to us by companies. And this is one of the great hypocrisies of user-based companies. The user-based company comes and says, give me a high value. Why? Because I have lots of users. Okay. And ask them, can you tell me something about your users? No, no, I can't tell you that, but give me a lot of value. That's the hypocrisy. If you want to ask me to value you based on number of users, then I'm going to push you back for information about those users. As I go through this framework, 
I'm in a sense giving you a list of questions that you can ask as an investor if Taxify comes to you and says, look, we want to compete with Uber. Would you be interested in investing in us? Hopefully by the end of this session, you will have a list of six questions you're going to ask them before you put your money in the company. Sir, let's go on the journey. Let's start by setting up the structure for the user base language. To value a company based on its users, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to value an existing user, and I'm going to take it to the framework for value an existing user. And then I'm going to multiply that existing user value by the number of existing users you have. That's going to give me the value of existing users in the company. But I'm not going to stop there, because I know you're a growing company, you're going to add users. I'm going to value the new users as a separate slice, because they're in a sense more work to get. You have to go out and acquire those users, so I probably need to know how much it costs you to acquire a user. I'm going to bring that in as my second slice, so there's my value for new users. And for my third slice, I'm going to mop up. Mop up what? There are some costs that every company has including user-based companies, that cannot be traced to users. GNA costs, corporate headquarters costs. They've got to go somewhere, I can't just ignore them. I'm going to estimate the value of those costs. It's a drag, and I'm going to reduce my value by existing user value plus new user value minus corporate cost is going to give me the value of the user-based company. Ready? Let's start with existing users. Before I show you the page, I'm going to ask you to start listing out the things you... So if I want to value an existing user, whether it's a Netflix subscriber or a rumor writer, tell me some of the things you will need to know from me to value users. First, I can tell you how many users I have, but forget about that. To value an existing user, if it's a the value driven by cash flows and risk, start asking me questions. How much revenue do I get per user, right? And there are three ways I can collect revenues from users. One is, I can do what Netflix does. How does it collect revenues? It charges you a subscription premium. It's a subscription-based model. Uber doesn't charge a monthly premium, right? So how does Uber make money off its users? It's every time you hit the app, it's a transaction-based model. If you never touch the app, Uber makes more no money off you. But the minute it does the app and call a car, so it's a transaction. So you can make money from subscriptions, you can make money from transactions. But Facebook doesn't charge a subscription for being on Facebook. There are no transactions you do on Facebook. So how does Facebook make money off its users? It's advertising. There are three ways you can make money off users. You can charge them a subscription premium. You can have transactions or you can sell advertising. Now there are some businesses which are hybrids. How many of you are in LinkedIn? Okay. LinkedIn has two models, right? There's a free model, which I use because I don't care about any of my LinkedIn. So in fact, when you ask me to connect with you in LinkedIn, here's what I do. Every two months, I go and accept everybody. <laughs> so it's like 25,000 people at Jimmy, right? It takes me like three hours to go to the click, 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 click. I have no idea who these people are anyway. <laughs> so if I accepted you as a friend and you were thinking you were special, <laughs> you're one of the 25,000 of them. But I used to, so LinkedIn free, they make money off the advertising. But there's a LinkedIn premium one. This is like what, $40 a month or something like that. So it's a subscription plus advertising. Any of you have Pandora? Pandora is subscription plus advertising, Spotify free. So you can think of hybrid models where some of your revenues. Incidentally, Pandora gets 90% of its revenues from advertising, 10% from subscriptions. Spotify gets 90% of its revenues from subscriptions, 10% from advertising. Which is better? We don't know yet. Right? Because there can't be one model that's best for every company. So one of the things I want to examine today is how do you pick the right revenue model for your company? Because for different companies, you might have different revenue models. So first question is, how much money do I make per user? And I'm going to tell you whether I charge them. So you're going to estimate revenues per user. It's going to be easier to estimate revenues for a Netflix per user than it is going to be for an Uber, right? You see why? Because Netflix, it's going to be $9.99 if you're in the US or whatever it is in the Central Europe, I don't know what it varies, because it's different in different 
but we know it's a fixed number, so it's even. Whereas for Uber, it's going to be a lot messier. Why? Because it depends on how much I use. So you let know how many rides is it typically. So, but that's the first step is you can get revenues. Second step is you have to figure out how much it costs you to service an existing user. I'm going to talk about Uber. So when they collect the fare from you, it's a very direct cost right off the bat, right? What do they have to do? They have to take 80% of the fare and give it back to the driver, already 80% leaves. But for different business models, you have to subtract out the cost because that's not, so you're going to take your revenues per user, subtract out the costs associated with servicing those revenues. You're going to be an operating income payments or almost all. You still have to pay taxes even though you're a user-based company. So you're going to get after-tax operating income. I've got my numerator. And I've been doing this for how long? You forgot asking one important question, which is, how long does a user stay in user, right? If I've got to go out and recreate my user base every year, I'm worth a lot less than if 95% of my users renew every year. So the next question you're going to ask me is, how long do you expect to get these cash flows? And the answer to that is going to depend on A, the technology I use, and B, what the renewal is. It's also called a churn rate among the companies, basically the percentage that drops off. So if I have those numbers, I have a numerator, I have expected cash flows over the lifetime. And remind me again what I need to discount those cash flows by? A risk-adjusted discount rate, right? So what I'm asking you, how certain do you feel about those cash flows over time? And with a subscription-based model, you might feel a lot more certain than with a transaction-based model. But I'm going to choose a discount rate that reflects the risk of those cash flows. That old-fashioned D dot C dot F is a lot more flexible than it looks. Because when I'm done, here's what my, my picture is going to look like. In the numerator, I'm going to have existing users. I'm going to look at their life. I'm going to look at what I call user stickiness. How much do they renew? I'm going to estimate the cash flows I get for users, net of taxes. And then I'm going to discount those cash flows back at a risk-adjusted discount rate. Right? What I get as a present value will be the value of my user. And that's incredibly abstract. But when you see me do this for Uber, you're going to see me struggling with the numbers to try to get something, but I'm going to come up with the value for existing Uber ride. I'll multiply by the number of existing riders you have. First slice done, I value the existing riders. But is Uber done growing? Not really. They want to add more riders, right? Is Netflix done growing? No, they want to add more subscribers. So my second layer, is to value new users who might come on next year, two years out, three years out, four years out. So there are two things I need to forecast, right? One is, how many new users will you be able to have? And how am I going to do that? Well, I have to look at your market potential, what I think your plans are. You could double your number of users, quadruple your number of users. What else do I need to know? Do those users just come on free or they just, what are you going to spend on advertising, promotionals? So I want to know what the cost of acquiring a new user is. Because if you can give me that cost, I can value a new user. as the difference between the value of the existing user minus the cost of acquiring a new user. That difference is the value of the new user. And if I'm growing fast, that's going to grow over time. Now I get to discount those cash flows, right? Remember with the existing users, I discounted based on the risk of the cash flows. Now I'm looking at the value created by the new users. Do you think this might be riskier for some companies? <coughs> It's more uncertain. You might not add new users, so I might attach a different discount rate. That's another advantage you get when you do user-based valuation that you could not use when you value a whole company. I can use different discount rates for different layers. I discount the second layer. I come up with the value of the new users that I estimate over time. So in this stage, I have to value all of the new users. Now comes the part where I have to mop up. What's mopping up? Any expense that's not user-related. So the cost of Uber headquarters in the Bay Area, that's an expense. It's not going to any of the users. That expense has to be borne by somebody. I think the present value of those expenses over time, and that is going to lower my value. I call this the corporate drag. What's going to lower the value? That brings in the rest of the cost. You add those three components together. You get a value of this company from the users. Up. Let's try this through. How many people in this room have the Uber app on their phones? Okay. So you know how it works, right? You hit the app and magic happens. 
and GPS opens up, and some guy starts driving towards you. Before you do that, you the Uber X, Uber XL, Uber whatever. But that magic is not free. You've been thinking that I, I don't know, first time I used Uber, I thought it was free, that I didn't charge you. And then I learned that you get charged on your credit card automatically. But let's see how the Uber model works. If you think about the Uber model, basically you download the app on your phone. But the app itself doesn't give them any revenue. They don't charge for the app, it's a free app. So right now you've got a free app. You hit the app when you need a car service. And it asks you where you are. First thing it asks you, can I turn on location preferences? Look at all that privacy crap thing that Facebook will do. What hypocrisy. You think you have any privacy? This morning, I got on my iPhone and checked how many of my apps know where my, loca know where my location is. Every one of my GPS apps knows where I am. There were 26 apps on my iPhone that knew I was in Prague at King's Court and what I was doing. It was kind of creepy. You're eating breakfast right now, I can see you. You're eating too much, you got to stop. That train's left the station. Everybody already knows everything about you. It happened about three years ago. So the stupid EU thing, you know, the privacy thing, that all it's done is created this front page. Every web page I go to, you accept it. I just accept everything. You keep in, my privacy is gone. That's, that train is left the station. You already know about me. You can keep everything. You can sell whatever you want. Nobody cares anywhere. But you do for a and you, call, you summon a car. The car might come, it might not come, it might come in three minutes, it might come in 13 minutes. They ask you to meet like two and a half miles away because they can't pick you up there. You walk and walk and walk and you find it, find it. You get in the car, you go somewhere, and then you get charged for whatever your fares. That's what Google collects. It's when you transact. There's no, it's not the app itself, it's your transaction with the app. So from that collection, they send 80% to the drive. Why 80%? Why not? There's no real good reason. I'm sure some guy who was at, you have to pick a number. Let's pick a number. And to show you how once a number gets picked, it becomes the status quo. Everybody else who came into business said, ooh, pick 80%. They must have done some serious research on why it's 80%. 80%, 80%, 80%. But for no good reason, but it's still 80%. So that's your first expense, 80% goes to the driver. Now when Uber presents to investors, here's what they say. We keep 20% of the fare. We're a very profitable business, it's all free. They're lying. We know they're lying. In fact, I'm going to show you how much of that 20% gets put back into service. And Uber admitted to this when they told us that the contribution margin, you know the contribution margin, whatever you left off, over after varying your cost, in the big cities that Uber dominates, they get a 7 to 8 percent margin, which means out of the 20 percent, 12 percent seems to go, go where? Legal costs. Why legal costs? How do I describe Uber? A rule breaker. When you break the rules, people are going to come after you. You need lawyers. So Uber is a lawyer's dream. Every city sues them, five lawyers, and that's it. I'm sure there are a lot of lawyers in Prague ready to go. But any moment now, Prague will walk back and Uber just like London has, and then two days later they'll be back. We have good lawyers, you'll be back on the road. You have legal costs. But there's another cost that I learned about two years before Uber admitted there was a problem. When I did my Uber valuation in June of 2014, I remember when I posted it. There's a guy who read it to, who was an Uber driver in LA and he wrote to me. Because in that valuation, I assumed they kept 20% of the revenues because that's what they told the world. And he said, you know what, that's a lot. They don't keep 20% because in LA, here's what happened. Last week, they paid me $1,500 to switch from Lyft. Now, Lyft is offering me $2,000 to switch back. I have a feeling Uber is going to offer me $2,500 to switch back again. This is like free agents without contracts. That's what these drivers are. There goes the rest of the money. So Uber is, keeps a slice of your 
fair, but it's not as big as it looked from the 20% concept. It's more like 7 to 8%. Now, Uber does spend money to acquire new users, mostly in the form of promotions. 30 free rides, 10 free rides. And in 2016-17, Uber acquired about 16 million users. That year, it went from 24 to 40 million. And my estimate is, and I'll show you where I came up with this number, is they spent about $238 to acquire each user. You see why I'm accumulating these numbers? Because I need these numbers to be able to value existing and new users. And I'm going to be trying to extract them from what Uber reports. So I now have an idea of what I call the user economics of Uber. How they make money, where they spend money, how much they spend acquiring users. And most Uber users renew. And this is a little tricky because when Netflix subscribers don't renew, it is obvious that they don't renew, right? They turn off the subscription, they stop paying money. How do we know Uber users renew? We don't. In fact, the, the renewal rate here is based on how many people actually delete the app from their phone. So you could have the Uber app and never use it and still you're viewed as an Uber rider. So 40 million riders, that's what they say, but for all we know, it's one rider doing all of the riding, and the remaining 39.99 million are just having the app on the phone. It's not the way it is, but it could happen. So with these numbers, I'm going to build off the value of the user. And I said, where do you get these numbers? I could tell you that I looked at Uber's financials, but I do not. Why do I look at Uber's financials? It's a private company. They don't let me look at their financials. In fact, here's what I knew about Uber in 2016 and 17. They had $6.5 billion in net revenue. So their gross billing was $20 billion. That's what they collected as fares. They had $6.5 billion in net revenue. That's what they told the world. And they also said that they lost two point eight. This company is a money-losing machine. That's not a good thing to aspire for. It's a money-losing machine. And they're proud of it. They lost 2.8 billion. So let's do some basic math. 6.5 billion in revenues, and you lost 2.8 billion. That's your operating loss. Your operating expense in 2016 and 17 must have been 6.85 plus 2.89 .8, So here's why I need that. I need to take that 9.3 billion and allocate it across the three places I think it needs to go. Some of that money is going to service existing users. Right? And the way I estimated that is, remember the contribution marks that I estimated 7 to 8 percent? That difference is really expenses associated with servicing users. That amount works out to about $4.5 million. So I took the 9.3 billion, and based on this very hazy number, and I told you up front that these numbers are going to be unplugging at, you know, whatever I can get straight, is 4.5 billion. That was my first slide. Out of 9.3 billion, my estimate is, Uber is spending four and a half billion servicing their existing users. Uber also in another rumored number, rumored that they're about three and a half billion in promotional and advertising costs. I'm not going to look a gift toss in the moon, in the mouth. So I took that 3.5 billion out from it and estimated that they spent 3.8 billion acquiring new users. Here's how it's going to help me. How many new users did they add last year? They went from 24 to 40, 16 million. If they spend 3,820 million collectively to acquire the users, 3,820 divided by 16 is 238.1. You see the grasping and straws. You give me a What else do I have? Right? The numbers are what the numbers. In this case, since I'm working with very broad numbers, I have an estimate of the value. That still leads to the next extra billion with no place to go. I'm going to call that my corporate expense. It has to go somewhere, so that's going to become the third step. So this was my first step, is taking the $9.3 billion in operating expenses and breaking them down. Let's suppose you were the VC that Uber is coming. SoftBank recently, Uber went to SoftBank and said, we like your money, right? So if you were SoftBank across the table from Uber, do you think Uber no has that information? They better, otherwise they're in worse trouble than I thought. You're spending $9.3 billion. I hope you know what you're spending it on. I would hope within the company they know how much is being spent to service existing users, how much to get new users, and how much is this corporate cost. It's true, I'm making estimates, but I'm making estimates because the company has chosen not to tell me. 
what these expenses are. So I'm going to evaluate existing Uber driver. Here's how I did it. I took the existing gross billings, which is about $500 per rider, and I estimated that you're going to keep $100 of that $500, 20%. Then I subtracted out those expenses, I estimated the other expenses, to come up with how much money I would make for existing users, about $52. And I projected that number out for the next 15 years. Why 15? This is a business where technology is going to shift. 15 years from now, who knows? We might all be in driverless cars, hovercraft, or Elon Musk has his way, boring our way under the ground, whatever it is, I don't know. I have no idea. Technology shifts, and I feel uncomfortable going past 15 years. So I project out the earnings for the next 15 years. I'm almost home. I need a discount for that. I'll tell you what I did not do. I did not estimate a risk-free rate, a beta, all those chapters in my book that I go through, I ignore all of them. It's pointless. My big problems are in the revenues, the margins. Why am I wasting my time finessing my discount rate? Here's what I did instead. Start of every year, I prepare a histogram of cost of capital of all companies globally. I actually estimate the cost of capital of every company in the face of the year. 42,668 companies. Sounds like a lot of work, but I automate. And once I get 42,668 companies, I create a distribution. You say, how does it help me? Do you think Uber is a risky company? Yes. How risky? I'm going to put it in the 75th percentile. You don't like it? You can make the 78th if you want. Who's financing this? At the 75th percentile, the cost of capital is about 10%. I'm going to use that as my cost of capital. You know what would have happened if I used a beta, a risk rate, a risk premium, debt ratio? I would come up with 9.87 percent. Think of how much time I've saved. 10 percent. I'm moving on because I have far bigger fish to fry here. So I take my cash flows for the next 15 years, discount them back at 10 percent. I get a value of 714 dollars per rider if a rider stays on for all 15 years. But you know, the riders drop off. With 95 percent renewal rate. And if I take into account the fact that riders right drop off, the value that I get per existing user works out to be about $410. I'm almost home. How many existing riders and users do I have? 40 million. 410 times 40 million gives me a value to the existing users of 16 million. Check. Let's move on. When you do valuation, don't get stuck. Keep moving. Because I've seen animals get stuck. Oh my God, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much uncertainty. What am I going to do? Bring my hands. I'm going to get an answer. Just move on. You can't control the world. You may, I made my best estimates. Could I be wrong? Of course I could be wrong. Does it bother me? Not in the least. <laughs> what am I going to do if it bothers me? I can't go in and change the numbers. This is all I can do with the information I'm given. I've got to find existing. What's my next slice? I want to value the new users of Uber. To value the new users of Uber, I need to estimate how many new users they're going to add over the next 10 years, over the next, over the life of Uber. In this case, over the next 10 years, I'm going to assume that the number of users that Uber has is going to go from 40 million to 164 million. You see, that's pretty ambitious. There are a lot of people on the face of the earth in the car service. Think about Asia. You got these countries with billion freight, China and India, so it's for one of those countries. It's got to be can't be the Czech Republic. I mean, they're really strong enough people. So you've got to go where the people are. And Uber's going to go there, it's going to add users. So I don't think it's in Samar. In fact, I think it's fairly plausible that they've quadrupled the number of users. I've got to estimate how much it costs them to add a user. I already have $238. Remember through my through the numbers? So I value an existing user, I value a new user right now much less than an existing user. Why? Because I've got to spend the money to acquire about $172 for a new user. And then I let the value get estimated over time. Partly because of inflation, that value is going to go up. I discount the value added by new users. And now I need a discount rate again. So now I said, you know, if existing users are the 75th percentile, New users must be riskier. So I did the 90th percentile. Again, 
you want to use the 88.75%, go ahead. I don't think you will get that much. 90% of my cost of capital is 12%. I discard the value added by new users at 12%. And what I get is the value for new users is about 20 point two billion. We're building up with big value. So the existing users are worth 16 billion, the new users are worth 20.2 billion. But there's one new set left, right? That billion dollars in corporate expenses is hanging out there. And that is not going to go away next year. It's not magic. So here's what I did with my final slides. I took the billion dollars in expenses I could not attach to anything else, and I projected it out over time. And I discounted that at a cost cap. Now here, if you want to get really tricky, you can say, well, that part of the cost is much, much more predictable than everything else, and go to the 50th percentile. I was too lazy to even do that, so I just took a 10% cost of capital, discounted it all back. Came up with a value of 10.4 billion for the corporate draft. So that is actually going to reduce your value because these are expenses you've got to cover. So I've got everything I need. So let's see what the value of Uber is on a user basis. Before I show you this, do you remember what I got as my value from the top down when I was accused of using 20th century technology to value a 21st century company? Do you remember the number? The bottom line number? 36 billion, right? So farther away, let's see if we get a wildly different number of our value based on users. So here's what I did. I added the value of the users, subtracted out the cost of corporate expenses, came up with 26 billion. That's the value of the operating assets. But Uber has 5 billion in cash. And last year, Uber exited China. They decided they were not going to compete in China because they were losing too much money. But in return for exiting, they got 20% of the Chinese ride-sharing company, DD. That 20% is worth 6 billion. So I added the 5 billion in cash and the 6 billion of DD. In fact, this year, when I value Uber, it's going to be you know, on my flight back. Six weeks ago, they exited Southeast Asia. They sold their share, the, 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 and in return, they're getting 28% of Grab Taxi, which is the Southeast Asia. There's a pattern here. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised what they do next is exit India and sell and get a piece of all that. And exit Europe and get a piece of tax supply. You see, why are they doing this? What did Dara Kashrahi promise when he became CEO of Google? What was he going to try to do? Take it public next year. So you can almost see them dressing themselves up. It's like getting ready for the prom, right? They're you know, like looking awful, I'm losing a lot of money. Let me look slimmer and better. And so basically, they're getting rid of all the money losing fat. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw stuff like this happen. But the value that I get after I add to that is $37 billion. All that work. <laughs> I don't regret doing this though because it opened the door to using this approach on other users. Okay. One aside, remember I said much of Uber's growth is going to come from all you got is India because you got out of China, you got to be a one other billion person country. Here's the problem I'm fixed. What did I say the value of the user was? About $410 based on gross billings of $500 per user. That might be true for US. Uber users, but in India, people are not spending that much. It's, it's, given the standard of living, you'd be getting much less in revenues in India. You're probably going to get $3 and not $30 a fare. You know where I'm going, right? And Indian Uber user is probably going to be worth less than a US Uber user. And that's where the growth is coming. Perhaps I'm overestimating the value of the new user. So there is that open question. If these companies are going to grow, and they're going to grow in, in China and India, the value of a new subscriber for Netflix in India is a lot less than the value of a new subscriber in the US because in India, a Netflix subscription costs only $39 a year. So don't do anything stupid like move to India just because your Netflix subscription saves you $60. But it, it does mean that when I have a revenue model built for Netflix, depending on what part of the world they go into, that revenue model can deliver me very different value. Any questions on the Uber user evaluation? Let's move to Amazon Prime. Last time I was talking about stories to numbers. I think I might have mentioned that I read Amazon for the first time in 1998. It was a 
start to reach. I have added Amazon every year since. And when I tell a story about a company, I like to catch a catchy name to it so I remember the story because otherwise I keep forgetting my stories. And I always described Amazon as my field of dreams. Right. Have any of you seen the movie Field of Dreams? Nobody? Somebody must have seen it. Huh? You seen it? You remember the movie? This guy called Kevin Costner. What is he doing? In the middle of nowhere, exactly. Iowa or nowhere, which is pretty much the same thing. <laughs> the baseball field in the middle of nowhere. And as he's building the field, one of his neighbors comes up to him and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a baseball field. And he says, there's nobody here who plays baseball. We have corn to cut and food to eat. We don't play baseball here. And you remember what he says? Most, one of the most famous lines in movie, in movie history. Don't worry, you don't have to be precise. I'll make you look good. What does he say? <laughs> If we build it, they will come. That is the Amazon theme song. If we build it, they will come. If we build what? Revenues, they will come. What's that? The profits. That has been Amazon's theme song through its entire lifetime. We will build revenues first. We might not make money, but they will come. It's been an amazingly consistent story. I've never seen a company be as consistent on its story. In fact, if you get a chance, go on to Google and type in Jeff Bezos 1997. <laughs> is that an Alexa in this room? <laughs> I told you privacy is gone. I've got to that in my house. That woman is creepy. <laughs> I mean, Alexa is not supposed to talk to you unless you say Alexa, right? <laughs> the last Shop. 
So when I want to buy something, and if I can find it on Prime, even if it's 5% more expensive, I buy it on Prime. Why? Because they get free shipping and no headaches. It's affecting the way I shop. I buy a lot more on Amazon because I have Prime. That's the first thing, I get free shipping. I also get Amazon Media. How many of you have Netflix? Okay. I have Netflix as well. You see, I subscribe. This is part of my research. That's why I do this. <laughs> Amazon Media is like Netflix for free. It's like, I would say it's a mini Netflix, but it's actually pretty extensive. It's actually better than Netflix on some things. And I get to watch every TV show on Amazon Media, every movie on Amazon Media for free. I can go onto Kindle and download books, and because I'm a Prime member, I can read them for free. <laughs> They spent, roughly speaking, 
about $120 in free shipping for every member. That number last in, in the updated financials was up to $9 billion. So they're spending a lot. That's their biggest single expense. They also have to buy the media to offer you, right? The Amazon media doesn't show up from nowhere. So I estimated that 10% of what they spend on technology and content, which includes the media, which is about $1.6 billion, is to offer me all those free movies and TV shows. And they also offer me special services, like Dropbox and all the other services. That costs them about $10 a member. So collectively, they cost a shipping cost, by far the biggest cost, service cost, plus media cost. And in 2016-17, the number of Amazon Prime members went from 60 million to 85 million. They added 25 million members. And they spent about $100 to acquire each member. So again, I'm trying to do what I did with Uber. I'm trying to figure out how they make money if they do on each Prime member and how much it costs them to acquire new Prime member. So let's try valuing Amazon Prime. And to do this, I'm going to start with an existing Prime member. An existing Prime member, I said, you get two sources of income. One is from the subscription, 99, 79, 94, whatever it works out to be. Plus, the incremental revenue you get times the profit margin. So that becomes my revenue from each Prime member. I subtract out the expenses. By far, the biggest expense is shipping costs. And I subtract out service costs and content costs. I come up with an operating income per Prime member. And it's pretty small right now. It's about $39 across that Prime member. And to value these prime members, I've got to make two assumptions. One is about how much the revenue per prime member, remember that $600 that I'm buying is additional stuff, how much that number will grow by. And the second big assumption is how much my shipping costs will grow by. I'll give away the game. If the shipping cost grows at the same rate as the, as the revenues, prime membership is a complete loss. So what does Amazon have to do to make their prime membership valuable? They've got to sell prime members more stuff. And so Whole Foods, 10% on. Um, and at the same time, keep shipping costs under control. If you look at everything that Amazon has done in the last five or six years, almost everything they've done outside of their cloud computing is designed to sell prime members more stuff and keep their shipping costs under control. Take the Whole Foods acquisition. When it happened, people said, why would Amazon want to enter the grocery business? Horrible business, terrible margins. I don't think Amazon was buying Whole Foods to get into the grocery business. In fact, the week after they bought Whole Foods, I started getting my first emails. We want prepared meals to deliver to you. You know, Blue Apron, which is the company that was created, started off with prepared meals, dropped in value 80% the day Amazon bought Whole Foods. I told you. If you're in a business and Amazon enters, might as well shut your doors and leave. 10% off on their Whole Foods groceries. But here's the other thing they got. When they bought Whole Foods, they got 500 Whole Foods stores, right? They said, so what? They refrigerated storage centers in 500 of the highest income zip codes in the United States. They bought a distribution system. Increasingly, almost everything Amazon does is designed to keep their shipping costs under control. That is by far their number one priority. Because if they can keep shipping costs under control, the value of Amazon Prime zooms. If they let it get out of control, Amazon Prime is going to collapse in birth. So if you look at the drivers of the value of a Prime member, one is revenue growth, obviously, the other is shipping costs. And the combination of those two, the fact that I'm assuming that they can sell 12% more every year, their prime members, and assuming that shipping costs will go to only 3% is partly what's allowed me to come up with a value of $486 per prime member. When I did this in October of 2017, there are 85 million prime members. 85 times 486 gives me a value of $41 billion just for their existing prime members. Now they're not done. They keep adding prime members. In fact, if I look at the new members added on, just like I did for Uber, and I estimate the value added for new member, the additional value that I get from new members is another 52 billion. So 41 billion plus 52 billion, we're up at 93 billion. We're talking about real money now, right? And if I subtract out the content cost, remember I said the content cost is a drag, I'm sorry, the, the, the shipping cost, 
If you subtract out the corporate cost, you end up with a drag of about 32 by 9 billion. That does drag down the value. But overall, my estimate of value for Amazon Prime alone, this is not Amazon the company, just the Prime membership. In October of 2017, my estimate of value for the Prime membership alone, if you add up those three numbers, is $61 billion. That was in October of 2017. In April of 2018, some of you might be familiar with my blog, know that I revisited the big four, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. I still can't call Google Alpha. It's all Alpha, no better. That's the whole story. And I valued Amazon. I valued Amazon Prime again. And the value that I got in April of 2018, when they have 100 million members now, is about 72 million. I did it an hour and a half before the earnings report came out, and the earnings report they announced increase in from 99 to 190. I revalued again two hours later, it's 90 billion. This is a great business to be in, right? Keep increasing your value. Now let me explain why I don't think charging $120 is going to make people go up. If you're a conspiracy-minded person, and some of us are, I could tell you a story about Amazon that's truly scary. And here's how the story would go. They give you this membership that is too good to be true, $99 a year. You, we all buy it. We all buy stuff on Amazon. We stop buying stuff at Target and Walmart, and sooner or later, one by one, they shut down. That's it. It's five years out. Every brick and mortar store is shut down. Amazon Prime now sends you an email. It, remember that $99 we used to charge you? We've added two nines to it. It's going to be $9,999 from now on. This is how I quit in a minute. Very good to go. There is basically, in a sense, there is this scary thought of if this is carried to its logical limit, this could be the only company standing. It's not just retailing. This is a platform they can take in pretty much any business. Amazon is the scariest business on the face of the earth. And of course, the first reaction is government should come in and protect us, right? And some people say we should break up the big tech companies because you know why it's going to be so difficult? 150 years ago, when governments came and broke up monopolies, customers were all in favor of breaking up the monopolies. Why? Because what did monopolies do? They charge you high prices. They break up the monopolies. And go, you break up Amazon, I'm going to come after you. Because I get 90 for $99. I get free shipping. Free shipping. Who cares about monopolies? You see, for 10 years from now, there'll be nobody else left. I don't care. I get free shipping right now. It's going to be very, very, very difficult for governments to actually break up these companies because the customers of these companies are not complaining. Are you complaining that Facebook doesn't charge you for the social media page you want? I don't think so. Are you complaining that your GPS is now free? Most of you are too young to remember, but there's a time you actually have to pay for Garmin and you have to buy these GPS things and put them in your car and pay in the net and you update and it costs you like a couple of hundred dollars. Now, of course, I get free GPS, but nothing in life is free. Right? Talk about location preferences. It's the first thing Google Maps or Waze or Apple Maps ask you when you want to go somewhere. Can you turn your location on? No. If I say no and I want to go to a restaurant, you know what it takes me? San Diego. From Prague, it doesn't know that I'm in Prague. They didn't tell me where you were. So they make it look like they're doing you a favor, but the reality is they're collecting data on you in return for a free GPS. And let's face it, most of us would rather have free GPS than privacy. This is why I think when people say, well, let's crack down on technology companies, let's make them do the right thing, it's easier said than done. So the Amazon Prime valuation, same structure as, it, but the key driver here is shipping costs. So each of these valuations, we ask me to identify a single number. With Uber, it's that cost that they face out of the 20%. With Amazon Prime, it's shipping costs. Let's move on to Netflix. I told you, I'm a Netflix 
and subscribe. Let's look how the Netflix model works. I pay $9.99 a month, roughly $120 a year in the US. Again, that price varies across. And in return, what do I get? I get this content, right? Ten years ago, that content was almost all rented content. You know what I mean by rented content? Netflix went to the studios and they get the rights to show movies and TV shows and you saw. And then Netflix discovered it had a problem. Here's what the problem was. The studios decided they were going to squeeze Netflix. So when Netflix went and said, we'd like to rent a movie, the studios wanted to shut Netflix down. They said, we're going to charge you 40% more. At least 2012. I'm sure people in the studio called. We, we showed Netflix. So what did Netflix start doing in 2012? Because they did not want to be at the mercy of the studios. Orange is the new black, right? That's what put And then you had, you know, House of Cards. Essentially, they said, we're going to make our own content. Guess who spent more money on TV content last year than any other company in the face of the earth? Netflix has changed the economics of the content business. Those studios are kicking themselves for pushing Netflix, and it's too late. That horse has left the barn. So now when I come to Netflix, I see the movies and TV shows from other studios, but I also see original content. And that original content gives Netflix two things. One is it gives them pricing power. See why it gives them pricing power? In the old days, all you got to watch was TV shows and movies. If some other streaming service came on and offered the same TV shows and movies, and they offered a lower price, you would switch. Today, if I switch, I don't get to see Black Mirror anymore. I don't think I can live without Black Mirror. <laughs> I just want to see how variable the show is. In fact, if you ever watch Black Mirror, it's like a Twilight Zone for millennials, so I don't even know what I'm doing watching it. I'm not a millennial. We <laughs> have one great episode followed by one horrifically bad episode. It's almost like they keep you hooked by saying, let's show you how much variance there is <laughs> in the stories that can come up with. But that original content keeps, we talk about the word sticky with user based models, and the word actually means something. What does sticky mean? Users, once they get hooked on you, don't leave. And it shows up in my valuation with a renewal rate for Netflix of 96%. You know what that used to be in 2012? It used to be like 81%. Over the last six years, as they've gone to original content, that number has come to 96%. So I project out the subscription revenues, giving Netflix pricing power, 5% increase. They actually don't spend on content cost at the user level. They have a big cost, but it actually is a cost they accumulate first, and then they go looking for users. You see, isn't that always the case? I'm going to talk about Spotify in contrast. Spotify looks a lot like Netflix if you look at it from the outside, right? They charge a subscription revenue, you can listen to music. So what? But it's a very different business model, and you're going to see it show up when I show you the value for existing users in Spotify. But for Netflix, every new user is pure gravy because you've already spent the money on content. So I project out the revenues and cash flows. I discount them back and here's what I get as a value. And so basically to do my calculation, I took the existing expenses that Netflix and allocated them just like I did for Uber. How much does Netflix spend on existing users? How much does it spend acquiring new users? And how much is this corporate cost drag? And Netflix has a huge cost drag because that content cost that they spend every year is going to be there, whether they're one member, a hundred million members, or two hundred million members. That's going to be something that drags the value down, but it does mean that new users are going to be worth a lot more in Netflix. Okay. So let's look at the value of an existing user, of existing subscriber in Netflix. So I'll project that. By now you can see the pattern of what I'm trying to do. I try to project other revenues, in this case subscription revenues, easier to do than what I did for Uber or Amazon because they're not transactions. I subtracted out the cost, I came up with expected after tax already. I discount back at the cost of capital and I get a value for the existing user of about $508. Multiplied by the number of existing users, which was $118 million when I did this a couple of months ago. And I get a value for the existing users of almost $60 million. That's the value of the existing users. I do think Netflix is going to keep adding new users, and if I value the new users, I get an additional 137 billion. 16 plus 137 is 197 billion, right? And then I subtract out that content cost drag, the billions of dollars. Last year, Netflix spent $9 billion on content. And what's making the problem worse is they're going global. So why would 
the link from what's because if you want to get new users in Spain, what do you have to do? You have to produce new content in Spanish. You can't just take English shows and put Spanish subtitles. You could, but you're not going to get new users. So now they're spending money on content, not just in the US, they're spending it around the world. So when I subtract out the corporate cost drag, I subtract out more than $100 billion because their content cost is so huge. So my value of Netflix as a company, by add together the tree, so I can say Spotify's cross track, it's 80 by 85 billion. Add cash, subtract that debt, divide by the number of shares. The value per share that I get from Netflix, at least when I did this two months ago, was $172. I'm going to talk to the company first question more than sex because we've got a stock price, right? With Uber, you could not because it's a private company. With Amazon Prime, you could not because it's part of a much bigger company. But in this one, you can, right? That's the question. It's about $220 to stock price. That's the next question. If I value it at $172 and the price per share is $220, come on, this is the question that will tell you whether I believe my own. Did I sell short, right? And why did I not? Because two hours after I did this valuation, because in each of these valuations, the day of the earnings report, Netflix came out with its earnings report, where it reported a big jump in users, and its stock price went from 220 to 250. How do I explain the 250? I don't have to, I didn't pay it. I've never felt the urge to explain what other people pay. Looking at Netflix as a user-based company, I'm a lot more pessimistic than most investors are because what they see is users. What they don't see is the content cost that, I'm, uh, that Netflix is spending to get those users. And the way I see it is, there's no way, easy way of this, this, this wheel that you're on because here's how Netflix grows. It goes out and makes more new content, more TV shows. Last, in the first quarter of 2018, one quarter, Netflix produced 18 new shows. And when I say 18 new shows, remember Netflix doesn't produce one show. It actually produces an entire season. The whole season comes on at the same time. 18 new shows. And 12 new seasons of an old show. 30 different shows in one quarter. No other company on the face of the earth is even within one third of that. And why is it doing this? Because it wants new users, right? You see, well, they can stop once they get the new users, can they? That's my question. Because let's suppose they push the users up to 200 million. What are these new users used to see? A new show every three days, right? Now Netflix says, you know what, we've decided we're a mature company. We're going to put in two new shows every quarter. I'm not sure those 200 million people will stay on. That's what makes me pessimistic on Netflix, is that content cost is not easily controlled. If we hate things, a really good reason why content costs are going to come down. I'm going to listen, but I haven't heard one. So that's the Netflix. And in fact, to show you the contrast, let's talk about user value dynamics. Let's think about things that drive the value of the user a subscriber and number. Is it 8.30? I, I keep my watch on whatever time I left in the US. So it's like 11, 11.30 in the afternoon somewhere in San Diego. So I guess it's 8.30. So we have a little so I'm going to talk a little bit about value dynamics. What is it that causes user value to change? Let me start off by listing some obvious things. We have a company, would you rather make, that it make money or lose money? This is not a trick question. Of course, you'd rather it make money, right? But if it's a young company, it's probably going to lose money. It's not a problem, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Young companies lose money. But not all losses are made equal. There are better ways to lose money and worse ways to lose money. Sounds like an absurd thing to say, but there's no good way to lose money. With the user-based company, let's say I, I'm the user-based company, I come and raise money from you. I admit I lose money. I lose three billion every year. Would you rather that I'm losing money because I'm spending it servicing existing subscribers, or would you rather that I'm losing money because I'm spending a lot of money acquiring new users? Which is a better scenario? That I'm spending a lot of money servicing existing users, or I'm spending a lot of money to get, to get new users. They can do it. It's pretty easy. Really I'd rather that you spend the money on users because then as you scale up, 
your loss is to become profits. But if you're spending a lot of money servicing existing users, you will get bigger, but guess what? Your loss will also get bigger. It's amazing how many user-based companies, when you ask the questions, you very quickly say, this company is going nowhere. I'll give you my favorite example of a bad company. You heard of MoviePass? This is perhaps the worst business idea I've ever seen in the market. Because here's how MoviePass works. $9.99 a month is what MoviePass costs. So you get a subscription. You know what you get in return for the subscription? You can go to a movie theater once every day. You're restricted to only one movie every day for the entire month. So you can see up to 30 movies. You know what the average ticket price for a movie theater in the US is right now? It's about $9. And that's in, across the country. In the cities, it's closer to $12. And Movie Pass pays the movie theater for your ticket. So think of the worst case scenario for Movie Pass. They sell it to you for $9.99. You go to 30 movies in a month. It's a month of 31 days. You go to 31 movies. Let's leave it 30. 30 times 10 is 300. And you're charging 990. I saw the CEO of this company. You can call this guy a CEO. <laughs> Explain the concept. And here's how he said, here's why he said it would work. He said the average American goes to only six movies a year. And we're charging $9.99 for one movie, so we should make money. What's wrong with that logic? What the moral hazard problem in insurance? You said one insurance premium for everybody. Who signs up with you? The sickest people on the face of the earth, right? Not the healthy people. You charge one premium for as many movies as you want. Who's signing up for it? Not the guy who never goes to movies, but the guy who wants to go to 22 movies every month. Like my son, my son is one of the first people on there. He said, Dad, can this be true? I said, it's probably too good to be true. But to let, to let the benefits as, as much as you can before they go back. <laughs> this company burns through cash like it's nobody's business. And the faster they grow, guess what? The more cash they burn and they're constantly puzzled. The CEO said, I don't know what's happening. We're growing fast, but our losses seem to be growing even faster. <laughs> so then he said, we've changed our business model. We don't want to make money from the movies. We're going to get it from big data. I said, what big data? He said, we know what movie you're watching. I said, really? You and 26 other apps on my phone? And Alexa, of course, who knew it before I went there. She was the one who suggested I come to this movie. There's no big data here, but people have become this enamored with big data, big data, big data. What big data? I'll tell you something about big data. Everybody has it, nobody has it. In this case, there's no big data. There is no good reason for this business to exist. But $4 billion dollars the venture capital money went into this business before it eventually is going to shut down. The question is not why it shut it down, but why it took so long. <laughs> Back to show you that this CEO really doesn't even belong on the face of business. He claimed he had a $300 million line of credit because he's running out of cash, right? He needs a lot of cash. He said, who would lend money to a company like this? And nobody had, you know how he came up with the 300 million? He took the remaining, you know how companies have authorized shares, naturally issued shares. He took whatever shares had not been issued, he multiplied by the market price today. And he said, that's my line of credit. That's not a line of credit. You're not going to get that if you issue the shares. If this guy really believes that's a line of credit, that's scary. Right? Because that suggests some deep disconnect from reality. I think that is a fraud. And he's hoping that people just have a million dollars credit who keep buying movie pass. So this morning I opened the newspaper expecting the business is shutting down. And the CEO is in the news again. He said he's introducing a family pass. <laughs> <laughs> where you can buy one pass for the whole family and you can go to as many movies as a family as you want. a bad concept and making it even worse. <laughs> but the scary thing is there are people lined up to provide capital for it. 
In the US, one of the hardest businesses now are doctor's bikes and doctor's scooters. Line bikes and bird scooters. Bird scooters. Basically, San Diego is filled with here's how it works. You know, these are basically you have a phone, you can download the app, and the app will tell you whether the nearest bike is going to be anywhere. There's no dogs. So basically it's not like the dogs you see, it's easy to be anywhere. So within hundred feet there's a bike. And there is a phone on somebody's front lawn. You pick it up, you unlock the bike, you get on the bike, you ride it wherever you want. And you abandon it wherever you want. Just lock it up again, you're done. This sounds like a terrible idea. You know what high schoolers in San Diego are doing? This is their fun activity after they're done with school. They're driving around the city looking for these bikes. And once they find them, they're throwing them down the cliff <laughs> into the ocean. This is how high schoolers get it. <laughs> I have no idea. In fact, let me take that back. I know this business is losing money. Hand over fist because they charge only a dollar per hour. And if a third of your bikes are going down the cliff, there is no way you can find so I asked one of the VCs who invested 300 million in line bike. So I invest in them. They look at the numbers. They say, no, there are a lot of users. No, bikes are on our front lawn all the time. I know there are a lot of users. So they're making money. They say, no, they're not making money, but it doesn't matter. Is there a collecting day? All right, where I get on my bike, where I get off. So they can show you restaurants around wherever you get off. You and Yelp and Google Maps and everybody else. But it's amazing. Data, big data has become a sloppy excuse for hey, Business doesn't work, we're collecting data. <laughs> so first question to ask, if I'm a user-based company, if I'm losing money, why am I losing money? Second question, if I'm losing money, would you rather that I lose money because I have a lot of fixed costs or a lot of variable costs? It's actually very closely related to the first one. You're a growth company, what do you want? Economies of scale, right? As you grow, you want your losses to turn profits. If my costs are variable costs, moving passes costs are variable costs. If they get more users, the costs go up with them. There is no way out of this box. I'd much rather that you lose money because you have fixed costs than variable costs. That actually is the reverse if you're a mature company, but with a young growth company, you want a lot of fixed costs. A great user-based company. Subscriber based company, member based company, as a combination of two very divergent numbers. One is it gets a lot of value per existing user, and it costs very little to acquire new users. That's a very difficult combination to pull up, and you make a lot of them. And that's where the, the right use of big data and networking benefits comes in. Let's talk about networking benefits. What are networking benefits? What does it mean? It's a buzzword we use all the time, but what does it mean? when you say there are networking benefits in this business. Usually as companies get bigger, it gets more difficult to get bigger, right? Because you've got the easiest customers first, and you can work harder and harder. So the traditional companies, once you got to a certain market share, really struggle. If you have networking benefits, here's what happens. As you get bigger, it actually gets easier to get bigger. You see why this works with Uber, right? If you become the largest ride-sharing company in the city, why does it get easier for you to become larger? Because when a driver wants to drive for a ride service company, he doesn't go with the startup, he goes with the established company. If you're a customer wanting a car, you want a car quickly, you're going to go with the service. So the networking benefits basically allow you to add new users at lower cost as you get there. So one half of the equation is so it's big data budget. What does Amazon collect? We already talked about Alexa. It's collecting data on everything you do as a prime. It's kind of scary. When I go to an Amazon page, it knows everything I've looked at. Forget about what. Everything I've looked at for the last, as long as I've been alive, I guess. As long as I've been on Amazon. It uses data, it's collect. This is a, a use of big data that actually makes money. They know what I like to buy, what I don't like to buy. And they use it on me when I want to shop. So what does it do? It allows them to sell me more stuff. So it allows me to get a higher value views. Great companies, that's a combination. So when you think about the value of the user-based company, you're trying to find the combination, you're trying to ask the question that allows you to do. One final point on Spotify, as you know, Spotify went public about three months ago, four months ago. 
And when the IPO happened, I valued Spotify on my blog. And Spotify looks a lot like Netflix on the surface, right? They collect a subscription revenue, and they do have a family membership and a regular membership. It's pretty expensive in the US, $14.99 for a family membership, $9.99 for an individual membership. And in return, what do you get? You get to listen to all the music that you That sounds a lot like Netflix, but here's the difference. Spotify doesn't pay for any of their music, at least when they put them on. You know how they pay for music? It's based on how often you listen to a song. So basically they keep track of which songs they listen to, and then they go to the artist and say, your song was listened to 15 million times. 15 million, they have this little equation that they have, so too complicated for anybody to even understand. The 15 million times this equation gives me five minutes, we're going to pay you five minutes. You see what it's done to content cost? Content cost now becomes a variable cost. It's not a fixed cost like it is for Netflix. So when they have an existing user, 79 cents of every dollar that Spotify collects in revenue from existing users, or existing subscribers, goes to cover content cost. And there are two problems for that. The first is, who gets these content costs? It's the artists, right? Now normally if you're a CFO of a company and you have a big cost item, and investors are asking you, what are you going to do about it? What's your usual response? We're going to cut costs, we're going to keep it under control. Spotify CFO cannot dare say that. Why? There's this tension between artists and Spotify already. You probably read about Taylor Swift pulling a music off Spotify, saying Spotify is unfair to us. So you cannot even talk about cutting costs, even though that might be your intent, because artists are going to be out of but here's the other scary thought. If you don't like Spotify as a company, I'll give you a way to drive you to bankruptcy. How much do they pay? They pay based on how much you listen to a song, right? Turn Spotify on, on your house, never shut it down. Don't run to listen. Just leave the house, let it play all day. I mean, they don't stop you. They run 16 hours a day. You know what they'll have to do then, right? All the songs that they listen to over the 16 hours, it's a it's a crazy business model. But you created it as Spotify. I'm going to use it to drive you to bankruptcy. So I was suggesting this to somebody at Pandora. I said, why do you guys have money? Spotify is competition. I'll give you a way to put them out of competition. <laughs> Already you can see the model that there are, there are rough edges. I think they're going to try to figure it out. Maybe the Spotify, you know how it figures it out, right? You, every 30 minutes, if you don't hit that button, you say, are you still there? When, when I first got it, what business is going here? I'm still there. I will tell you when I'm leaving. But you can see why they ask you, are you still there? Because they're afraid that if they don't do that, it will run all day. So when you think about Spotify and Netflix, take it through. Both those Excel spreadsheets are on there. You can download them and play. One final point. Did I make a lot of assumptions and valuing an over user and I'm not a member? Absolutely right. So one of the things I did at the end, you can see the results at the end of this uh, presentation, was I actually, rather than use a single number for everything, I used to distribution. I did this evaluation all the time. It's called a Monte Carlo simulation. Rather than give one number for each input, you put a distribution. What does it give you? It gives you a distribution of that. And rather than tell you an Uber user is worth $410, which sounds hubristic because I really don't know. I give you a range, I give you a distribution. So the median value is about 410, but here's what the high number is, here's what the low number is. It's a much more honest way of dealing with these users and subscriber based numbers. Here's what I think needs to happen. Companies now increasingly come to market say, hey, pay me a high number because I have a lot of users. I think the information disclosure laws have to be triggered. The minute you tell me that you're worth a lot because of a lot of users, you should be required to tell me what you know about the users, how many users you have, what it costs you to add a user. Basically, everything we look for to value an existing user and a new user, we need to ask as part of the information disclosure. Because without it, how can I decide whether you were 3 billion, 5 billion, or 35 billion? We'll be incredibly sloppy, but we are to venture capitalists, investors, by giving these user based companies high values just because they're.
I think it is getting a little long, so I'm going to stop the presentation, open it up for any questions. You have any questions? It doesn't have to be about what we talked about today. About whatever you want. And if I know the answer, I will tell you. If I don't know the answer, I will make it up. <laughs> so, if there are any questions, far away. Go ahead. I'll repeat the question. Don't worry. You don't have to take the mic all your time. Amazon is not a mature 
to your company. Would I buy Amazon at a dedicated account? No. But my valuation for Amazon is about 600 million, which no Buffett, no old time value investor would ever attach because they're, it's almost like their valuation models are designed for either mature or declining companies, in which case, you can take the existing earnings and extrapolate. So I agree with you, Amazon is overvalued, but not for the reasons you said. It's not because the earnings were six billion that worried me, but when I pull out the growth rate and I don't have a conspiracy story, I end up at 600 billion. If I were to know the conspiracy story, I would end up above 800 billion. Okay, I mean, yeah. you know, Papa says here that you should get uh, investing as kind of the most intelligent way to look at this as you are business, <coughs> businessman, right? So if we, or if I had 800 billion, so I have option one. Let me ask you a question. If Amazon was 500 billion, do you buy it? No. I would. Because I'm getting the great business. I think Buffett has, I mean, let's face it, Buffett has his blind spots. He's not God. <laughs> he does say some stupid things. Yeah, but, but and, and, no, let me finish. He, he does say some stupid things. And last year, actually, I was in Omaha. You know what happened in Omaha? It's called Value Investors Woodstock. The Berkshire Hathaway meeting, where people gather from around the world and they worship. <laughs> At the day of two 90-year-olds, who tell them what to do. And I think that's extraordinary, I'll tell you, it's extraordinarily dangerous to base your investing on somebody else's philosophy. Is Warren Buffett a successful investor? Absolutely. Would he be successful if he started today? I don't think so. His investment philosophy was built for the time he was in. And you have to give him credit. He stayed within this say-so, which is what? Buying mature companies that he said he understood. That used to be his dividing line, right? I will not invest in something I don't understand. He bought the Washington Post, he bought Coca-Cola. Notice it's all, you know, he bought Seeds Candy. Essentially, it's things you could see and understood. The problem is that part of the economy is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So guess even what Warren Buffett had to do last year? He bought Apple. Does he understand smartphones? I don't think so. <laughs> not that he's not a bright, but the technology of smartphones, 20 years ago he said you can't buy Apple, you can't, but the reason he was forced to buy Apple is there aren't enough companies that meet his own time value investing criteria. So I give him credit for what he's done, but at the same time, you can't work with somebody's offer, then it's fine, you want to buy value. But I tell you the problem with old time value investing, it's built on the presumption that value has to be already on the ground. So I have a great growth company. You don't let me pay for that growth company because you say, well, growth is uncertain. You think what's on the ground is certain. The world is shifting. Businesses that used to be stable, predictable companies are no longer so. So if you don't want to buy Amazon, do it for the right reasons. Do it because you valued Amazon with the story built in and you came up with the value lower than price. Don't do it because the earnings to price ratio is only 1% because that metric has lost its use. It's not flexible enough. Yes? How do you value startups? So, like, with no track record, no history? That's your question. When I value a regular mature company, what do I base the value on? Expected cash flows in the future, right? What made your life easier with a mature company? You had a lot of history. What do you not have in a startup? History. You might not have a business model. So, what's the difference? You're making your forecast on much less, right? Either case, you make a forecast. So here's the difference. With a mature company, you feel more comfortable. Why? Because you have the history. With a startup, you're going to feel a lot less comfortable. There's nothing different about valuing a startup other than the fact that you're going to feel you're very uncomfortable. Why? Because you're playing God. Right? You're saying, I think this company will come up with a business model. I think it will produce a product. I think. So when I do my forecast, I still have to do my forecast, I just don't have the comfort of those financials. And that's a psychological value you've got to get over. Because if all of your valuations are on spreadsheets and they're based on forecasting in the past, this is scary, right? Because there is no basis. There is no basis. So to me, there's nothing different about that the startup other than the fact that I've made estimates on the
fact, it's a lot more fun. I'll be quite honest, to value a young company than an old company. It's just, I have a lot more fun valuing Amazon than, than just, I mean, that we, it's, it is a lot more fun when there's a lot more happening out there. So enjoy the moment while you're uncertain. Any questions? Yes. First of all, thank you for coming to Prague. And my question is, uh, today's presentations or today examples are mostly based on hard data. And uh, oh, okay. did you say hard data? I don't think of it as hard data. It's really, really soft data. Right. So my question is, if you work uh, in your evaluation, uh, in this is soft information. For example, I'll give you some sort of an example. Give me an example. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you would like to make evaluation of Tesla, yeah, and based your evaluation on uh, on information, how many cars they produce, how uh, how high their cost. But if I tell you that Elon Musk will leave the company tomorrow. How much it influences your value? I think it will increase the value of Tesla 25%. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. It's only one example. I'll tell you what. Has Elon Musk been an asset to the company as it grew from nothing to this? He's a great visionary, right? And he's been the right person for the company to get to what it is. What's Tesla's biggest challenge right now? 30 by 500,000 Tesla 3s that they promised. Can you imagine Elon Musk sitting on a supply chain meeting? I can see it. Elon Musk is a great visionary, but he has a problem. The problem is he doesn't have time for the mechanics, the making the trades run on time, supply chain. And I think if he's not careful, he will make the company crash and burn. You can't wake up every morning with a new vision. This is the company. That every day we're like, oh my god, we're going to be boring tomorrow, we're going to make helicopters, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Stop! Get those 5,000 cars off the assembly line every week first, and don't act like you invented this business. You know what I mean by that? People in Silicon Valley sometimes drive me crazy. They think that nobody before them had any sense. That this business they created is the first time anybody's run a business. That's the attitude Tesla has brought, right? It is true, Tesla has more vision than the typical automobile company, but I'll wait till Volkswagen and Ford have forgotten more about building assembly lines than Tesla knows as a company. He could have learned from them, but he refused to. When you buy Tesla, you're not buying a company. You're buying a personality. Right? You're buying a person with the upside and the downside. So when I say that the company could be better, I think here's what Elon Musk needs to do, and I don't think he will do it. Elon Musk is often compared with Steve Jobs. Right? But I remember the first Steve Jobs. Do you guys remember the first Steve Jobs? Many of you probably don't. I owned Apple between 1981 and 1995 when I saw Steve Jobs almost crash and burn the company. Why? Because he was a visionary, would not listen to anybody. He built the Lisa computer, which I bought, and the biggest mistake I ever made, because it's a computer that was built for obsolescence and had no expansion features, because that's what Steve Jobs said customers should want. You almost destroyed the company. He got pushed out. And then there was the second coming of Steve Jobs, which is when he became a legend. So let me ask you a question. What was different about the second coming of Steve Jobs? as opposed to the first one of the Steve Jobs. First one was older. He started Pixar and built it out. But you know what the biggest difference was? When he came back to Apple for the second go around, he hired a chief operating officer named Tim Cook. A guy without a visionary bone in his body. But a guy who could make the trains run on time. And this is where you gotta give Steve Jobs credit. He gave them full power over operating decisions. He said, I'll be the visionary. I'll wear the black turtle next shop and put them in show pictures. And I'll, I'll lead the people on. You make sure the smartphones get delivered on time. That's what he's saying. Do you know what Elon Musk needs to do to make Tesla a successful company? He needs to get his own version of Tim Cook and, in a sense, delegate the power and let that person make the operating decisions on production facilities. Stop tweeting every 15 minutes. 
Every time it test, in fact, I ask people who are test for investors, can you name me one other person on the test for management team? Can you? Can anybody help me? Other than Elon Musk. That's the only name that comes to me. That is not healthy for a company. I don't know who their CFO is. I don't know who their chief. I don't even know whether they're a chief or I don't know whether they're, they're any manager. For all I know, Elon Musk is like an emperor. He sits on the crown and breaks with the cars. I don't know what happens to Elon Musk. This is not healthy. But it goes with the personality. He's a visionary, but he's got an ego the size of I don't know what. And he will not concede power. And that, I, my fear is. And you know where this manifesto, I know there's, there's a hand up there, but last year, Tesla borrowed five and a half billion dollars in September. I have a blog post right after they borrowed money, and I said, I don't get this. You know why it didn't make sense? How much money did Tesla make last year? It's a trick question. They lost two billion. If you lost two billion in this company, why the hell would you go borrow five and a half billion? You see, for the tax benefits, what tax benefits? <laughs> You're losing two billion. You see, because I can't raise capital any other way. You're Tesla. Your stock price is three hundred dollars. There was no good reason. You know why? Because Elon Musk probably woke up in the morning and said, "I'd like to borrow five and a half billion. And that company, he says, "I want to borrow five and a half billion. The board of directors is like a rubber stamp. Of course, that's do it right away. This is a company that is out of control because the CEO is out of control, but he's not created anything below him to come and help oh, so, Now, this, is a, this company has the potential to be a great company, but it needs to make that transition from being a visionary startup to actually a company that delivers cops. Because that's not an abstraction. You need assembly lines that run. And you need those cars to come off. So the, the, the rest of this year is going to be a testing proposition. You say, why is the Tesla stock price drop? It's a personality cut. Right now, Elon Musk gets up. In fact, last, last week he said, one of these days, there will be 5,000 cars running off the assembly line. And people said, he said, one of these days. That's very optimistic. It could have been none of these days. Let's push up the stock price $20. <laughs> okay. This is a company that's in danger of having an ego to destroy the company. You know, it's long to answer your question. But the, the soft thing there is the vision. But to me, that was the soft. Even when he was a vision, you know how it showed up? The story I told for Tesla four years ago when I first valued them was a much bigger story than what was on the ground. Why did I give them a really big story? Because this guy's a visionary. He's going to find a way to expand this car, this company, from being this tiny niche company to a company that can produce tens of thousands of cars. I gave him credit for his vision. And that's how it showed up. It's a much bigger story and a much bigger value base. Question back there, somebody? Question? Yes? What do you think that an appropriate price for a Bitcoin would be? What would the appropriate price for what? Of a Bitcoin. Or what do you think about cryptocurrency <laughs> in general? Somebody would ask I mean, if there is any value <laughs> after all. <laughs> Did any of you read my post on Bitcoin? If you didn't, I'll, I'll compress it. First, what is Bitcoin? I'll give you the choices. When you have an investment, it can be one of four things, and you can tell me which one it is. It can be a cash flow generating asset. Right? So if you have a real estate, if you have a rental building, obviously cash flow. It can be a currency, it can be a commodity, or it can be a collectible. You know what collectible is? Basically, it could be paintings, it could be art, it could be. So, is it a cash flow generating asset? Bitcoin is definitely not a cash flow generating asset. Is it a commodity? There are other cryptos that are commodities. Ethereum, for instance, is a commodity. You know why? Because it can be used for smart contracts. Bitcoin is not being marketed as a commodity, so it's not a commodity. So really the two choices you have for Bitcoin are it's either a currency or a collector. It's a bad choice. You know what? Neither can be bad and they both can be priced. Let's look at whether it's a collector. You know when Bitcoin was the idea of Bitcoin was born? No, 
the exact date was. It was the middle of October of 2008. And I want you to think about that day. This is right in the middle of the worst crisis we've had. It was a period where we lost faith in everybody, in central banks and governments. It was born out of paranoia. And there's a reason I mentioned that. Because the entire structure of Bitcoin is built on the paranoia. You want a paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto. You're thinking intellectual Japanese guy. No, no, this is a pseudonym. We have no idea who it is. It could be a fat 300 pound lady sitting in a basement in Cleveland calling him. Satoshi Nakamoto was a pseudonym. We have no idea who it is. And he came up with the idea of Bitcoin, October 2008. And you know what he wanted it for? When you do a Bitcoin transaction, how does it get checked? What, what, who are the people who check it? They're called miners. What does that tell you about the original idea of Bitcoin? What were they trying to do? They were trying to create an alternative vote. Right? That was the original idea for Bitcoin. It is its goal for the millennials. So it's mind that old-fashioned yellow stuff. You buy this new fashion, you can't see it. So. <laughs> and that is why Bitcoin will never make it as a good company. Because if you look at people who promote Bitcoin, they talk about how it's going to be a currency. Tell me what makes for a good currency. It has to be a good medium of exchange and a good store of value, right? It doesn't say you should make a lot of money. Currencies are not measured on how much money you make. It's measured on medium. So let's think about some currencies. Is the Swiss franc a good currency? You put 100 Swiss francs in your pocket in Zurich Airport. You forget about it. You land in New York. You can convert 100 Swiss francs into dollars or euros or whatever currency. It is a good medium of exchange. I can take it all over the world and use it. Is it a good store of value? I put 100 Swiss francs in my pocket and I forget about it. A year later, I land in Zurich. I might be able to buy more stuff than I did a year ago because it's a currency with deflation. It's a great currency. Great medium of exchange. Great store of value. What about the Indian rupee? You know what? In India, when, I, when you go to Mumbai airport and you go through the passport section into the international section of the airport, if you try to buy anything at a store, you can't use rupees anymore. It's the most insulting thing you can think of. You're still on Indian soil, but now in the international section of the airport, they would accept only dollars and euros and Swiss francs, any currency other than rupees. The Indian rupee is a medium of exchange you can use in India, but that's it. You fly out of India with 100 rupees in your pocket, that can't be converted. It's not a thing. It's not a good medium of change. Inflation rate in India is about 7%. You put 100 rupees in your pocket, you come back to your lady, you buy a lot less. It's a very average currency. How about the Venezuelan Bolivar? <laughs> I'm not even sure people in Venezuela accept it anymore. They say, can you have it? You have it? Pumpkin, you can give me instructive trade. Old and bad investors, this currency does. It's a horrible medium of exchange, and it's a terrible store of value. Can you imagine putting a thousand bolivar in your pocket and forgetting about it for thirty minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Inflation rate is like fifty thousand percent. You might as well use this toilet paper after that. It's a horrible currency. So even with the fiat currencies, you have great currencies. That have. So here's my question: Where in this spectrum? Who do you put Bitcoin? Is it closer to the Swiss franc or is it closer to the Venezuelan world? The question I'm asking is how good is it a medium of exchange? You guys in Prague seem to like it a lot. With all these ATMs with Bitcoins, I put pictures of them all over. What do you guys do? You take Bitcoin out of there. Lead me through this process. You take the Bitcoin and what exactly? Can you go buy food at a restaurant? Yes. Yeah? So there are Bitcoin restaurants. Where are they? They all look the place. I know the ATMs. I can get the Bitcoin out. I want to know where I can spend the Bitcoin. <laughs> so now we're getting specific. So I have to go to that particular store to buy my stuff. It's one of the largest retailers in Central Europe. That's not bad. Because in New York, I asked this question, and I spent Bitcoins. And of course, there is Bitcoin from Monday's day on the test. There are these stores, and they send me a list of six. 
Let's see. I want lunch. There's one pizza store on that list that you want to place. 15 miles away on the subway. And the side tells me, I start, I go on the subway 15 miles. I show up at the store and he said, we stopped accepting Bitcoin. <laughs> I said, what happened? Yesterday we had a transaction. And we, you know, transaction, we had to wait forever to get it confirmed, the cost. So essentially, Bitcoin's hype has gotten ahead of its use of the currency. I'm glad it's being used in Prague because that is the pathway for Bitcoin. But you know why people are reluctant to use Bitcoin as a currency? Let's hear a shock people. You decide to put your prices all in Bitcoin. You know what your problem is going to be? Every 15 minutes you have to go and revisit those prices because Bitcoin prices move so much during the course of the day. It's very difficult for you to have a Bitcoin price. What makes it so attractive as a speculative investment for traders is making it a terrible currency. We know what needs to happen for a currency to be a currency. It's got to be stable. It can't move around 30%, 50%, 80% every day. And the opacity in this market is just scary. Norman, you know, you can see a price. Price is set by demand and supply, right? The Bitcoin pricing process is not the most transparent process in the world. In fact, last week you probably read about, I don't know whether this is true or not, about how last year the price was manipulated. I don't know whether that's true or not, but the process is opaque enough that I believe that it could be manipulated. That's not Bitcoin. And here's the problem. What's the maximum number of Bitcoin you can have? What's the what's limit? If this is a currency that comes with an upper limit, no good currency in history has ever done this. 21 million, right? You had 21 million. Right now, when you have a transaction, you have miners who check these transactions, using up enough power to run like six countries. Or a few thousand transactions. What happens when you get 21 million? Because right now, that way you pay miners is you give them Bitcoin, and because you have I think you're right now at what, 17 point something million. But the, it's almost like a, like a math problem that is getting more and more difficult the closer to 21 million that you get. That first guy who paid for pizza with 100, do you remember the story? The first guy in 2010 who paid for his pizza with like 100 Bitcoin. He's probably kicking himself right now. That transaction probably took one miner on a small computer. So as you get closer and closer to 21 million, this process is going to get more and more efficient. Let me put it this way. You cannot build a currency completely in paranoia and not trusting anybody. And Bitcoin is built on that base. You can't trust anybody. That's why it's, it's in a sense an extension of crowd, whatever, right? So when you think about picking a restaurant, how do we pick a restaurant? We let check out here. Who checks restaurant reviews anymore? When you want to go see a movie, I don't know whether this is true in the US, I check out Rotten Tomatoes. What do I care about the New York Times review of things? And Bitcoin is built on crowd testing. That's what the mining process is. It's an incredibly inefficient way to check transactions. The thousands of miners in Ukraine have to go on, um, on computers because I want to buy a cup of coffee. It sounds like an absurd thing to do. The reason it has to be somewhere else is Power has to be cheap. You know that Bitcoin mining is concentrated in the cheapest power parts of the world. It's not an efficient process. It is just not a good currency. I'm sorry for the ATF, but it's not. This is not a general statement about all cryptocurrencies. Can we design a good cryptocurrency? Absolutely. You know that good cryptocurrency has to be focused on being a currency first, and a speculative investment next. So stop telling me how much money you made from Bitcoin and how much money you lost from trading on Bitcoin. I want to know that you're working on making Bitcoin acceptable in more stores, more restaurants, more businesses, because that's what good currencies do. So if you think about cryptos, don't put them all into the same bucket and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Bitcoin might pass on. But the technology that Bitcoin delivers, which is the blockchain, is going to stay on. The blockchain process is a process of checking transactions. 
It's a process that could prove to be more efficient than other processes in certain types of transactions. I'm not as optimistic about the blockchain as some fintech people are. But I do think it will succeed in some aspects of it. So you might not believe in Bitcoin and still believe in blockchain. Or you might believe in Ethereum and not in Bitcoin. So in a sense, we have to start dividing up the crypto space and thinking about, hey, does that make sense? Because I don't think there will be a cryptocurrency in a decade or so. But that cryptocurrency will be more transparent, will be built on more trust. The most efficient blockchains are trusted entities. You will have more trust and you'll have more efficient transactions. What do you think is, uh, what's your biggest conspiracy theory? You mentioned that before. What's my biggest conspiracy theory? <laughs> I believe in conspiracy theories. I would never get on a plane and go somewhere. I use conspiracy theories to think of many cases. I'm not a plane believer in conspiracy. I don't do that much. So, I should think that we run out of time. So, everybody, I would like to thank you for sticking around. I'm like, for a joke. I was about to say, I'm like our banner there. <laughs> I, I, I'm here to tell you one thing. So there was a small banquet prepared uh, right in the cafeteria, but there is no time left. So we probably won't be sitting with Professor Damodaran there, but there are some sandwiches and water and probably Coke. Uh, I mean, the black stuff and the white stuff. <laughs> and you can get it, right? Now I would like to uh, give word to Albert to thank Professor Dunder. <laughs> Professor Dunder, uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of all of us here today for coming to Prague and for giving us the opportunity to host you here. It's been a pleasure. And as a, an expression of our appreciation, I would like to give you this little glassy picture of Prague, uh, especially of Charles Bridge. Is a weapon on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I hope they will allow you to leave the country. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I would like to keep you here, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've got other business to do. Um, so, I don't think I want to say anything else to anyone. <laughs> One more thing, sorry for that, I, I just remember what I wanted to say. And I hope we will maintain this great relationship with you. And I hope you will put this glass thing next to your screen in your office so that you remember your great audience in Prague.